curiosity helps you look over the horizon. And so, you know, one of the things that you always have to do is be thinking about, so what's coming next? Okay. You have to have a, by, by being curious, being curious about the world, being curious about other people and yourself, uh, you're actually able to say, well, let me see what's coming, you know, over the next four or five or 10 or 15 years. That was the voice of world traveler and debut memoirist, Bob Dana. Bob is my guest today on the Page and Stage podcast. And as always, I'm your host, Jason Cannon. Before diving into my conversation with Bob, I want to give a big shout out to Alitu. Alitu is the all-in-one podcasting app that I use to put this show together. And if you're thinking about starting up a podcast of your own, I cannot recommend Alitu highly enough. You just upload your audio or record directly in the app, easy as a Zoom call, and boom! It converts the files, levels the volumes, reduces the background noise, does all the other magical mixing stuff, and even includes a free music library and hosting. There are even more bells and whistles to Alitu, so check out the show notes and use the link there to learn more and sign up. Now, let me tell you more about my guest, Bob Dana. Bob is a scientist, an engineer, a secular humanist, and he is insatiably curious about the world and the universe. He served as a naval officer in Admiral Rickover's nuclear reactors program before becoming a business leader and ultimately retiring from Deloitte Consulting as a managing director. Bob has more than 50 years of experience in learning transformation, leadership development, and engineering and associated management consulting. He provided advisory services worldwide for both commercial and governmental clients. Bob, as I mentioned, is a world traveler, both for business and pleasure, and has accumulated millions of airline flight miles. He is also a self-proclaimed experienced junkie who loves anything live, music, comedy, sports, theater, anything and everything, from Super Bowls and Olympics to solar eclipses and world fairs. Bob currently lives in Las Vegas with his partner Lacey. He has one daughter, and most importantly, he has two grandchildren. And they were the inspiration for Bob to start writing his memoir, My Curious Life, which was published this year by Ibis Books. Here we go with my conversation with Bob Dana. After some battling with the microphones, I am here on the Zoom with Bob Dana. This is a delight for me, Bob. Many of you who listen know this because you follow my newsletter as well, but Bob is one of my authors with Ibis Books. We dropped his memoir, My Curious Life, just a, what, a few months ago, Bob? Boy, time. Yeah, April 8th. <laughs> April. It was in April? <laughs> Man. Yeah. So Bob zooming in with me all the way from Las Vegas, where how are you handling the heat? I'm, I mean, I'm in Florida, so we've got heat, but the headlines I've been seeing says there is some heat on you right now. There is absolutely heat in Las Vegas. We, we hit the hottest day ever, 120 degrees a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, it certainly has been north of 110. Now, 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 with that, it is dry heat. The humidity here is like five percent. You know, like uh, like the inside of your your oven. Uh, right. So, <laughs> <laughs> that, I don't know if that smells in Bob. Come live. Uh, I'm not trying to sell it. I'm not trying to sell it. But you know, the, the, my my strategy, and it has been for the last few years, is to uh, is to get out of town. So, uh, actually, we spent five weeks in Hawaii through June and early July, and I just got back from Park City, and Park City was beautiful. So at this time of year, June, July, August, we try to, to get away, if we can, to somewhere other than uh, another hot spot. So, right. uh, but, but, uh, but it is hot here, uh, and uh, you just kind of adjust. <laughs> right. The, the body learns. <laughs> right. Great. So I want to start, because since you are in Vegas, before we get into all of your amazing stories, because you got to go to the world premiere opening of The Sphere, that new amphitheater in Vegas. Now, I was in Vegas just last October when it was just about before it opened, but they were doing the projections, you know. So I had like the tennis balls and the football helmets and the amazing, 
I ran each morning past it and the I forget how the millions and millions of LED lights are. It was stunning. It's a stunning addition to the skyline there. But you got to go to the opening show by U2 inside the sphere. I just saw, I think Grateful Dead is there now or something. I assume you've come. Yeah, and, and we, we've got a whole series of, of, of bands that are coming. Uh, plus, there's also, if you get to Las Vegas, you can have the sphere experience. Uh, so you can actually go there cost like 150 bucks uh, and they kind of demonstrate the full capability of the sphere itself because jason one key thing is what you see on the outside isn't what you see on the inside so the inside is is effectively like a tv screen that surrounds you inside of the sphere uh so we did go to see u2 uh u2 was wonderful but the sphere was really the show and so at points in the show, actually, the, the, the inside of the sphere uh, projects a, an image of the Las Vegas Strip. So it looks like you are actually outside. Uh, it's that crystal clear. And they, they, are, they are synced to the music. And then everything that goes on inside of the sphere is as much of the show as the, 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 the seeing you too. I've seen you two before. Put you two together with the sphere. It was it was beyond description. Yeah, I I got to read a couple of reviews and just it makes me think about how a song, which already has lyrics, right, and tells a, a version of a story, to add that amount of visual oomph to the song has just got to amplify the lyrics, amplify the experience. I remember reading something about he would like held a balloon and the string went up and turned into a digital balloon or something. I mean, it absolutely. Well, they, and those, those are kind of the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the more mundane part of it. Those are the, those are just the amazing parts. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not the incredible parts. Uh, some, you know, the incredible parts are, you know, they, they bring you, it, it looks like you're out in the, in a star field at night. You know, like I said, you're, you're, it opens up and it looks like you're in the desert. You're in on the strip. The, the, I mean, it, just everything about it. You know, plus they also are projecting you two on, on the screen. Well, I don't want to call it a screen. On the inside of the sphere. So it's not a projection. It's just, it's again, like a t picture, picture your TV set uh, that's 150 feet tall. Yeah. That, that that degree of clarity. So amazing, amazing, amazing. It's just one of the many, many, many amazing things that go on in Las Vegas. Uh, it's just, this is just an incredible place to live, I must say. Well, let, well let's talk about that. Let's, let's kind of back into your story here. Like, how did you end up? Because I know you are a world traveler. You've lived in a bunch of places. I, I got to, for those of you out there, I got, I was an editor on Bob's book and helped him kind of get it all put together and then publish it. So I, I, I have the skinny here on this man's ridiculously <laughs> fascinating life, but how did you end up in Vegas? Yeah, that's, that's a good story. Yeah. I mean, I actually, it's, 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 I've lived a number of places in, in the U S like I grew up, I, I was born in Brooklyn, grew up on Long Island, went to school in Manhattan at Hunter college. After graduating Hunter college, wound up being cr recruited by the Navy. I moved to Orlando, Florida for four years in the mid-70s, and then to Columbia, Maryland, joining a consulting firm. They relocated me out to San Diego uh, to help build their West Coast operations, then back to Columbia, Maryland to be a senior executive of, of the firm for a while, then to Sacramento, then back to San Diego. In all of those times, I, you know, I was always kind of coming to Las Vegas for conferences, my in-laws lived here, uh, so we would get you know, for the holidays and those kind of things. And I really started to, uh, to, to, to think about you know, what I was going to do when I was retired. I'm 73 now, started thinking, you know, in, the, in my 50s. So where do I really want to have a home base that would be my location uh, you know, for quote-unquote retirement? And so ultimately, actually had two places. One, a, uh, a condo, actually downtown San Diego on Pacific Highway, right across from the cruise terminal, and then had a place here, a, sm a small place that, that I had started changing my residency to Las Vegas. And then, you know, finally I said, I really like Las Vegas. I'm going to sell the, the condo in, in San Diego, and this is where my roots are going to be. And then the family all kind of migrated here. And so all the grandkids are here. So it's, uh, I'm here. 
Okay, I got to take a quick little detour because you just, we're on video together, even though this is an audio podcast, but you just turned your head a bit. And is that, how long is your hair now? Oh, That's yeah. That, well, there it is. Wow, uh, it is like uh, in a <laughs> ponytail. Okay, so let's jump, let's jump a few years back, Bob. Part of your <laughs> story, you were a hippie. Uh, I, I was I was a hippie oh, back in the... So I died in the wall of hippie. <laughs> Uh, I, I absolutely, absolutely, Jason. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so again, seventy-three. You can do the math. I was born in in nineteen fifty-one. So, I was a teenager in the sixties, and then you know, certainly a, a young adult in the early seventies, and certainly embraced the kind of the hippie lifestyle. And so, uh, long hair, beard, on and off and on and off, and uh, certainly, certainly was 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 a hippie by uh, by choice. And and I think the hippie dumb kind of never left me, although. You know, obviously, I joined the Navy. I was a naval officer and then a consultant for 40 plus years, uh, which uh, you, you can't have a ponytail and, and be taken seriously if you're, a, you know, engineering or management consultant. Uh, so needless to say, I fully retired January 1st. The way I define that is I no longer get paid to do anything. Uh, so, you know, if you want me, happy to have a conversation with you. Happy to do some advisory, consulting, you know, support. Uh, happy to make you successful, but don't pay me because I don't want to uh, to effectively answer to the man anymore. Uh, and and this is this is part of that that new Bob Dana image, which is longer hair, ponytail, and and uh, it effectively makes a statement about you know who and what I I was and, and who 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 really I I feel like I want to uh, to be. We're gonna to have to update your author photo, Bob. <laughs> no, 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 we won't. <laughs> All right. So, speaking of your book, my curious life. This is a, it's, it's a, your memoir. It's your memoir. Talking yes. about, I mean, everyone listening already can hear that just the, the vast array of experiences you've had. But let's start at the very beginning of this book because this this was fascinating to me. What motivated you? Like lots of people talk about wanting to write down their stories. I, I meet people all the time in my classes and workshops saying, oh, I want to write a memoir. And I always, I always start them with small stories and prompts. You came to me with like a full draft done. You, you didn't need motivation, but I'm curious what sparked you in the first place. What made you think I've got to write this stuff down? Uh, yeah. Well, the, obviously the, the, what happened was I'm getting older. Okay. I know at this point I've got a, a, a less, a lot less in front of me than behind me, and so you know one of the things that I, I, I really was starting to think about was you know is there something that I need to do in order for in essence uh, you know kind of a, a legacy for my grandchildren because uh, could my daughter tell them about me? Eh, probably not. You know, certainly, you know, was she paying attention, you know, uh, growing up? She's 38 years old now. Was she paying attention? I don't think so. And so, you know, one of the things I really wanted to do is make sure that as they, you know, right now, uh, they're, they're, they're five and eight. And so, you know, by the time they're teenagers, I don't know if I'm going to be around, you know, and certainly as they, as they kind of mature, you know, I want them to know their grandfather. And, and you know, I, I've had a lot of lessons learned and, and life experiences. It would be great for me to leave that for them you know, more than anything else. So I think that was one of the big motivator, motivators. I, I, one of the other things is, you know, I am a, uh, I, I, I follow rock and roll music and folk music. And, you know, that, that's my kind of passion. I can't, can't sing, I can't play, but I love music. And my favorite couple of artists, Meatloaf in particular, uh, passed away beginning of last, well, a couple of years ago. And I think that really kind of hit me that, a lot of the a lot of the, the the folks that in fact you know I have followed from a music standpoint uh, are not dying. I mean, uh, so so and they, they, he was you know he was seventy five. I'm seventy three. I mean, uh, same thing with uh, David Crosby from you know uh, I, you know I just I just I was was starting to get hit with the fact that you know like I said there's a lot less in front than behind and and tomorrow could be the last day and, and I wanted to make sure that that the grandkids had something to uh, to have. That was that was more than oh he left me some money or or you know I remember going to Hawaii with him or whatever I mean uh, uh, you know I I really wanted to leave him something of substance so I started writing initially I was just going to leave some notes but then as I started to write it got a little bit more and it got a little bit more and I started to I had to put some stuff together and then finally uh, you know Jason uh, and I kind of connected and and you and I 
uh, you know, it wasn't just an editor. He really was my development editor. So, so Jason, thank you so much for that because uh, it was it was certainly an, an interesting exercise. I had never done it before, first book. So, you know, J- Jason would come back with all of these X's and move this here and throw this out and what about this and what about that? And so he, w- he made me crazy a bit, but uh, it was a, a totally fascinating process and I'm very, very happy with the relationship that we have and uh, that culminated in, in the book. I feel the same way, Bob. And I actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask you about two particular things that we worked through together in terms of how to tell your story. Because again, when it first came to me, it was very, very linear. It was very straight through year by year by year. And in my memoir classes, I say this all the time, that no, no one really cares about the right order of events. That's, that's for the world of history and autobiography. But in a memoir, in a memoir, we can jump through space-time because we're connecting lessons, we're connecting emotional through lines, we're connecting ideas. And chronology is the least interesting part of the human experience. So there's two key things that we had to work on together. And I want you to talk about your experience kind of finding them with me. One was your voice, right? That we got very specific about. One of the first exercises I gave you was to tell me more about your grandkids because you had mentioned this to me that they were one of the reasons you wanted to write this. So then I asked you basically to write about a day when your grandkids visit. And then we got all the way to why don't you write this to your grandkids as if they're older, you know, they're in their 20s and 30s, they can actually understand what you're saying and write it to them as if the reader is your grandkid. Right. So that was one thing we had to really kind of suss out together was voice. And the other was structure to the point of getting rid of chronology. And the thing that you really grabbed onto and ran with was the idea of your life as a five act play. Remember that that kind of manifested out of our conversation. So I'd love for you to talk about those two concepts, the voice, how you got to the point of talking to your grandkids and kind of how that unlocked you. And this idea of your life as a five act play and how that helped you structure this memoir. Yeah, for sure. And, and uh, actually, our conversations were, were very, very informative in terms of the way that uh, y- you and I were able to, to kind of structure that. Uh, the, the, the voice, I think, uh, the voice, I think, was a very interesting conversation to, uh, to have with you. Uh, and so what we decided to do, which I think uh, hopefully worked, uh, the feedback I've been getting on folks that have uh, read the book has, has been very positive. But what I I wrote is actually to uh, my my grandchildren, and so I'm I'm mentioning their mother and their grandmother and myself and our travels, but it's all spoken to them. So when they do uh, read it, uh, well, I I hope they read it. Uh, actually, uh, the title is uh, "My Curious Life." If my grandkids ask about me, tell them this. So I don't think there's any guarantee that they'll actually ask about their grandfather. I hopefully they do. Uh, but maybe not. So the reader is actually looking over my shoulder uh, as I'm speaking to them and trying to, you know, give them a, a, an understanding of uh, who their grandfather uh, actually was. And there's 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 actually three different parts to it. So as as J- Jason just mentioned, uh, you know, there is in fact a um, uh, three a five act play. Uh, that I kind of break my my life into to kind of give a, a a flow of of you know how things happen where where the where the crises were uh, how I kind of navigated through powered through some of those uh, and and kind of ultimately give that in I don't know it was about forty fifty pages or so but then uh, what I wanted to do is go in and actually deconstruct myself because I have not lived a linear life. You know, I've had lots of twists and turns, lots of decisions that if I made one decision or another decision, it would take me in a completely different direction. Um, and so the next part of this is deconstructing Bob Dana. So, you know, uh, so I am a curious person. So I start to talk about me as as an intellectual uh, and as somebody who loves to learn. Um, and what does that feel like? And then I also talk about some of the major elements that are still in Bob Dana, okay? Even though I might have been a management consultant for the last 15 years, uh, you know, I started as a physicist uh, uh, with a, a bachelor's and master's degree in, in physics. Uh, I did physics uh, and, and the like. So what, did, what was that like? Uh, then I kind of deconstruct myself into uh, my, 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 my role in the, in the Navy as a naval officer, okay, ultimately leaving the, 
the, the Navy as a lieutenant commander. Uh, then as an engineer, I uh, actually achieved uh, kind of pretty much the highest level in, in the engineering community. Uh, and so, you know, each one of those uh, is now deconstructed. And then I take another part and, and then it's like sitting down with the grandkids and uh, it's talking to grandpa, you know, over the, over the dinner table. Let's talk about, you know, let's talk about my travels in the U.S. Let's try to talk about uh, my travels worldwide. You know, let's talk about this. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about religion. Talk about politics. This is, you know, the, the crazy grandpa having that conversation. And, you know, you know, where did it come from, you know, way back in the 60s? Uh, and so it, uh, I try to do all of those different things. but. But actually, um, having that conversation with you, I think, really made me think about how to present this in a way that you know they could actually dip into a given chapter uh, and read a chapter and figure out, oh, okay, now I really understand something about my grandfather. Same thing with the readers. They can dip into any chapter and probably walk away with an understanding of what this guy's insights uh, from all of the experiences that he had, has had uh, are, are maybe useful to, uh, to be considered. Yeah, that's, that's one of the fun parts of uh, the let's talk about section, that it's almost becomes like a little field guide or a handbook. And you can literally open it up to sort of any chapter you're interested in and pull something useful out of there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are you useful or not? Uh, yeah, I, well, or not? Yeah, I'm, I'm making an assumption. <laughs> <laughs> so, some of it is, is going to be kind of controversial because uh, one of the things that most people don't realize, you know, again, I was a management consultant for for uh, executive, uh, you know, senior executive at a, at a number of consulting firms. So you kind of assume that you know this guy is from from the picture that you saw uh, that you're referencing. Uh, is you know conservative is is probably a, a Republican it, you know it's whatever and it's nothing is further from the truth uh, and so uh, you know same thing with 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 re religion in terms of uh, you know my my opinions about that uh, are probably not what you would expect so that's one of the taglines that Jason you also kind of came up with uh, which is uh, hey this guy isn't what he seems. Uh, yeah, my name, uh, my name is Bob Dana, and I am not who you think I am. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that that was that that's 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 your tagline, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it's, it probably couldn't be truer than uh, than that. So, Bob, we were just talking about that tagline. Uh, my name is Bob Dana, and I am not who you think I am. And for those of you listening, if you haven't checked out the book yet, which you should. And I'll put the link in the show notes. Yeah, Bob is your prototypical, just on surface, white, straight dude. This is something we all do. We make assumptions based on appearances, right? And even in my theater work, that's something we have to be very, very cognizant of. It's, and you probably dealt with this in business, Bob, is that the first five seconds when someone comes in, man, oh man, you make that first impression and it is so hard to undo. Humans make first impressions so quickly and they are the hardest ones to shake loose, whether it's on a stage, in a boardroom, whatever. So that kind of exploding this idea, playing with this idea of I am not who you think I am. And I remember we talked about this too, like how raw do you want to get in your <laughs> memoir? <laughs> like you don't, you don't pull any punches and that's okay. It's your book, right? But talk a little bit about that idea, then that front, I mean, even to the point now you're growing your hair back out, right? When, when you say, I am not who you think I am, I don't think it comes across in a pugilistic or, or aggressive way. It's more about you claiming your identity back. You, you talk to me about having to kind of put on masks, play certain roles based on which room you were in. And so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what it means to go into those different rooms and play a character and what it feels like now to release that and almost using this book as your relaunch party into being your truest self. What has that been like for you? Uh, actually, it's been, well, it was cathartic to actually write the book because it allowed me uh, to show my, my real and true self, or what I call kind of the authentic Bob Dana. Uh, you know, it's, uh, everybody says, oh, you, you really want to bring your real self to, uh, uh, to work, okay? Be authentic. Well, you can't do that because most people, you know, are not 
um, are not who they, who you think they are. Okay, this is just not me. This is my bet is it's most folks. Absolutely. So we leave leave that you know outside of the uh, uh, the office door uh, and be what we need to be in order to uh, to actually navigate business. Uh, or or life or whatever. I mean, you have to you have to be uh, kind of sensitive to all of that. And so, yes, I, I was. Uh, I, I don't think I've, I've changed any personally. Uh, I am just now, you know, more um, more open. Let me give you one example. One example is um, uh, I have been my extent of of uh, working kind of the social networks uh, was LinkedIn. Uh, so I've been on LinkedIn since it was pretty much uh, launched. Whatever it's now been, fifteen twenty years ago. It must be more than that, I think. Uh, <clears throat> but that was that was my place, and I was there as a business person. Okay, uh, and so that's who I was, uh, and everything about me was there as a business person. So uh, with uh, with me getting kind of ready to um, to retire January first, uh, with the book coming out uh, in in April, I said, "Well, I'm going to take on one more." Uh, so I am now on on Facebook, uh, but I am the authentic Bob Dana on Facebook, uh, and so. You ever want to say, yeah, so, 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 and I could be that because, like, uh, I don't care. Uh, so the hair is growing out, yes, uh, but also now I can be more me uh, in in the social networks. Uh, and the only one that I'm really uh, added to this is is Facebook. So this is interesting. Really quick, just a quick side, sidebar on this. So, it, are there two different Bob Danas on the socials? Is LinkedIn still sort of curated toward business Bob Dana, and is Facebook just the come see, you know if, <laughs> come for the full hippie experience? <laughs> uh, uh, like I'm sure there's overlap, but do you treat them a little bit differently? Kind of yes, but almost no. Uh, <laughs> so so probably up to maybe. Uh, a month and a half or two months ago, yes. Facebook, uh, you know, I don't, I didn't, you know, I don't care if people know what uh, my political, religious, uh, uh, social, uh, you know, kind of uh, standing is. It's all in in Facebook. That was certainly not in LinkedIn. Um, yeah. But with this election, it's it's very interesting that LinkedIn has now become much more political, uh, and so. Uh, so I, I am, I kind of follow a number of different, uh, so, so Emily's list, uh, vote vets, uh, these are, these are kind of democratic causes and liberal causes. There's a number of them that are now started to, uh, to, to pay, be way more prominent in, in LinkedIn. Uh, so now I'm following them. I'm participating in the discussions. You know, I'm, I'm kind of actively doing that in my, uh, my persona, uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, is now starting to navigate a bit towards that based on where we are in the uh, the presidential and election cycle for, for this year. Yeah, that's, and that's so, so interesting. It's almost like you're, you're you said you're the person, and I love that too, the personality of Bob Dana on LinkedIn is like evolving in real time in response to how the entire platform is shifting. That's so yes. interesting. That you would not this, have... The story you're telling about yourself has to adapt to the new plot lines. Well, and it, and you would not have seen that 6, 12, uh, 18 months ago and certainly right. not three years ago. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely none of that. And now you go on LinkedIn and you're starting to see a number of folks effectively pulling back the curtains on themselves as well. Uh, and so oh. at this point, I feel very comfortable pulling back the, the curtain on myself uh, and voicing my opinion and actually... Uh, you know, this was just, you know, one, one of the things that kind of occurred was, uh, I was on one discussion, uh, where, uh, the, they were bashing Vice President Harris, uh, you know, around this whole DEI thing. Uh, and so, uh, I got in there and actually I, I know a lot about DEI have being a management consultant and, and, and certainly have embraced DEI probably for the last 40 years, uh, even before it was DEI. You know, I defended uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, I, I, you know, kind of really, uh, you know, kind of pushed back on a lot of what was being said there. Uh, and then I had others kind of come in, even through the the the, the LinkedIn Messenger, uh, and say, "Thank you so much, Bob, for defending uh, Vice President Harris." Uh, and I really appreciate this, and blah blah blah, and started making connections with folks. Uh, you know, and and again, looking at me, they would have never guessed that I was going to be a major 
the supporter, and then even even more so the supporter of DEI and and what it does, and you know not 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 calling uh, Vice President Harris kind of names around how she got to her position, you know, based on this new uh, approach to bad mouthing her and the the whole of uh, uh, of uh, of DEI. Right. So in a way, this. This has unlocked new connections you actually wouldn't have otherwise made. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, and and actually, one of the the women who who did reach out to me, uh, I'm going to have a, a conversation uh, with her, but next week I think it's on my calendar now. Yeah, so it's it's yeah, the brand new connections uh, in a totally different way, and people realizing who and what I am uh, in a way that they probably never would have thought uh, was the case. Yeah. Just getting to tell your story the way you want to tell it. That's so for anyone listening, right? If you, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put a warning on the episode too, but <laughs> please, but do. yeah, the book. I mean, <laughs> th- this is kind of the joy of writing your memoir and of taking ownership back of your story is that you don't have to, you know, you don't go out and intentionally offend people, but you don't have to apologize for believing what you believe or and Correct. for stating what you believe, especially if you state it in a way that is respectful of what other people believe, right? It's just, just that classic thing of, I can hold my boundary and I can claim who I am, but I don't have to put you down in order to do that. Correct. Uh, and, and all I'm doing in the book, too, is, is, is stating how did I get to where I am? Okay? Exactly. What, what, was, what were my life experiences, you know, even as an eight or nine or 10 year old teenager, uh, you know, back in you know, school, college, et cetera? You know, what were those experiences that effectively shaped me? And one of the things, Jason, that, that I think is important also is that you and I kind of zeroed in on uh, the area of curiosity. Um, yes. Uh, and so initially, the title of the book was going to be My Boomer Life, because uh, I'm right. a baby boomer. Well, that's okay. right. I, forget, I had forgotten that. You're right. That was the uh, original uh, title. Uh, and I, I, I brought the boom down. I was like, I don't think you want to call it this book. <laughs> no, no. no. So we went back and forth, and 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 and, and you kind of kind of kept pressing me as to what was the the real kind of theme of your life, uh, and it was that I'm curious, uh, and I'm curious about the world. I'm curious about other people. Yeah, probably less curious about myself, but certainly curious about myself and personality, and how how does my personality manifest? You know, and people, you know, seeing me and and me interacting with other people. All of that's in the book, and it's, it bubbled up to be, in essence, the title. Yeah, that's you probably forgot about that, but that was one of the conversations I, that we. <laughs> I totally had. I, it's all coming back now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I love, but this, yeah, that idea of curiosity is so powerful. It's such a strong motor, and I think I'm remembering now too. The way we got there was also ultimately I was pressing you on. If your grandkids take nothing else away from reading your book, what is the thing they should take? And you came up, you were the one who was yeah. like, be curious. Yes. Please, for the love of everything good, be curious. Yes. Ask questions, challenge everything, be a skeptic, be skeptical. You know, if, if you are all of those things, I'm hoping that at least one of them becomes a scientist. But if not, you know, they, they will at least, at least use a kind of a scientific method uh, to be thinking about yeah, how to navigate this this crazy world. Bob, we were just uh, talking about curiosity and how that came to be the title of the book. And one of the things you are most curious about is solar eclipses. How many have you been to now? How many solar uh, six. Eclips- eclipses six. have you you've attended? Six solar, and, you, and not just like in your backyard. You seek them out. Like you and Lacey like book trips to go check out solar eclipses. And you're with all the solar eclipse junkies. So I'm I'm curious. One, how did that fascination start? Two, what do you get from them? Right. Yeah. Three, what's the next? What, uh, what's the next one for anyone who wants to meet you in person? They'll they'll meet you at the campground. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, oh man. Well, I, again, I, I I kind of mentioned for for a moment that uh, I'm a physicist uh, by uh, education. Uh, you know, bachelor's and master's in physics. So I'm a scientist even back from. My fifth grade, uh, my, my fifth grade science teacher, I think, convinced me that science is where I wanted to go. Uh, and so I've always been somebody who, who kind of follows science, think about science and, and think about scientific things. Well, in college, uh, as a, um, uh, as an undergraduate, 
uh, we had a, a, a physics club, or effectively a lounge for physics majors. Uh, and you probably don't think that physics majors are, are, are fun and funny, uh, but we actually are. Uh, that program, Big, Big Bang Theory, and you know them sitting around like like they do. Yeah, you know, that that was that was me uh, back in the in the early seventies. Oh, um, Big Bang uh, Theory is basically a documentary. It's a PBS in the Wild show. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so so anyway, we're, we're sitting around talking about uh, you know things, and and it, it happens that we see that there's going to be a total solar eclipse uh, that will be uh, in Canada. I was this is obviously I'm, I'm in Manhattan. Uh, so we're in New York City, uh, and where the eclipse is going to occur is about a thousand miles away. We decide that we're going to go see the the total solar eclipse, and it was about six of us, uh, three vehicles, uh, a microbus, a VW Bug, and uh, and an old Fiat uh, Spider, uh, and we made our way up there. We brought telescopes and cameras, and blah, blah, you know, uh, and it's the it's the same one that that you hear in. He's so vain by Carly Simon, if you know that. Yeah, so, so he took his Learjet up to Nova Scotia to see the total eclipse of the sun. Same one. Same one. Uh, the only difference is uh, we didn't do it by Learjet. So oh, we of came, course, right. Yeah. We, we camped our way up there and back. And so that's where it all started. But then uh, we, we actually, in the, in the book, I talk about us coming back and, and then pitching uh, Hunter College on. Uh, actually funding a, a real scientific expedition. The next one would have been in, in Mauritania in Africa. We got all the way to the end. There was only two of us left to uh, to, to be selected. I had to go to uh, uh, the Hunter College funding committee that was funding you know major college-wide uh, initiatives. And ultimately, there was two of us left, uh, us, a bunch of, again, physicists, uh, who are who are going to be uh, you know, really kind of doing a, a scientific expedition to, uh, for the next solar eclipse, which was going to be the longest solar eclipse for years. And the other the other uh, uh, project that was being uh, uh, evaluated was actually uh, daycare for uh, <laughs> for for the college. Was again, I'm, I'm a liberal, so I'm 100 percent supportive of, of all of that stuff. But uh, we lost. <laughs> We lost in the daycare. <laughs> so, uh, so needless to say, I started kind of looking then at, at others. Uh, one that that uh, kind of the next one was was actually a uh, eclipse cruise that I took in '91. Uh, then we saw another one uh, later that year. Then in '99, went to uh, to Europe, Vienna, 40 miles south of Vienna. Uh, so, oh, by the way, the the, the one in '91 was in Mexico. Uh, it was an eclipse cruise, uh, and then. Uh, we went up to Idaho, and then I was just uh, this this past year. Oh, oh April eighth, the day yep. that book came out. That's right. You uh, dropped it on the eclipse day. On the eclipse day, and so we were actually in Texas uh, with Bill Nye, the Science Guy, and the Planetary Society in uh, Fredericksburg, Texas. Uh, they put together an event. Eight hundred of us showed up in this uh, field. Um, uh, and uh, Bill Nye is there, and uh, all the Planetary Society, and all of the science geeks, and had a great old time. So, why, so the question is, what, what, yeah, what, why? Okay, number one, it's 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 unique. But number two, when you actually stand in uh, the the shadow of the moon, so so the moon moves over to cover uh, the disk of the sun, and then the corona bursts out from behind it. Uh, it's just it's it's like we were talking about earlier on with the sphere and being in the sphere to you can't oh. it's, it's 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 indescribable unless you actually experience it all the pictures you see and all of that and it's like oh I saw a partial eclipse well you didn't see an eclipse you saw nothing okay uh, you saw you saw nothing it was a waste of your time to even step out of the door to look up okay it's like you know, you got you got to you got to go and actually see. In person, it, it is the most moving thing you'll ever see. And I describe all of the eclipses that I've seen uh, in in the book. The next one that we're gonna uh, we're starting to look at is actually in Australia uh, in a couple of years. Um, oh my goodness! Uh, it's going to come right through Australia and actually right over Sydney. Uh, so uh, that's that's the the next one we're doing. So it's yeah. So and it takes years to plan, right? It's not something that you just say. Oh, you know, let's just go and do this, especially right. with, with where it is. Oh my goodness! Okay, so thank you. That's that's amazing. 
all of this stuff about being a physicist, all this science angle, there's something you said to me once that really stuck with me. Because of the field you're in and your curiosity, you are always getting the newest tech as soon as it came out. Like you used to carry a slide rule in your, <laughs> right? <laughs> on, my, on my belt, on my belt. On your belt, you had a slide <laughs> rule on your belt, like mathematical Batman. Yeah, yeah. And it, now nothing, today you've nothing, got- Nothing say, says geek. Uh, more yeah. than, than having a slide rule on your belt. <laughs> <laughs> We've come all the way there. From now, you've got an iPhone in your pocket, right? You've yeah. got this piece of technology that has on us. I remember reading this once that the an iPhone has more tech in it than the entire first moon landing. That's oh, how oh, quickly. Uh, uh, hundreds and thousands of orders of magnitude. Yes. Yeah. Being who you are and going from slide rule on your belt to iPhone in your pocket. Talk to me about the story you see in terms of tech, the, the benefits, the scary parts. Like, what do you think is going to happen next? Like, what, what are your hopes for tech? When you think about your kids, right? And you were very specific, your grandkids, I mean, you were very specific when you were writing about your grandkids that when they come over to your house, it's a no screen zone and you get out all these older toys made of wood and metal and, play, and they have to, Legos, they have to create their own worlds. That's the rule at grandpa's house is that here's the chest full of toys. It's all analog, nothing digital. And that's a very intentional choice on your part. But it's not because you don't like digital, like you don't like tech. It's because you want to inspire their brains to work in creative ways. How do you square that circle with then like, but technology also is awesome. You've come from a slide rule to a phone. You keep your grandkids firmly in the analog world as long as possible. Talk to me about your relationship with tech because I just think it's fascinating. Yeah, and just, uh, Jason, just to be clear, at, at their home, uh, there's nothing but tech. So, these, <laughs> you know, so these little guys are already on a pad. You know, they, you, know you're, you hardly can get a word in edgewise when you're in that that their house. Uh, and so that's why it's like, don't bring it over my house. We're gonna wait because one of the the big things that I think uh, is getting lost with the, with the generations, and I, I'm I'm gonna now speak as a as a old man, uh, <laughs> is uh, that you know we actually had a gut feel for numbers, for mathematics, for things, lots of, because we, we kind of grew up without it. So you had actually had, have, a, have a real gut feel for, uh, for a, what an equation is, how it was going how, how to deliver a number. I'm not punching in numbers, and then there it is. There's the answer. You have no understanding whether or not you even put in the right numbers, okay? Right. Uh, and, and so by having at least a gut feel for, for how things work, uh, I think is, is important. Now I, you know, I, I did, you know, adopt technology. I, was, I did computer simulations as part of my master's thesis in physics. Uh, you know, I, I, I so it was back in the seventies, uh, and so I, I absolutely have embraced technology all the way. But I think there's a real balance between kind of embracing technology and pushing technology, and not losing the perspective of what the technology is actually modeling, what it's actually telling you. You know, not just delivering information, but you've got to be able to understand the context of that and how it actually kind of kind of drives you to make decisions, to gain insights, et cetera. So where is it going? And and one of the one of the things that I do talk about in my website actually, uh, and I just posted a a blog on this, is uh, that curiosity helps you look over the horizon. And so you know, one of the things that you always have to do is be thinking about, so what's coming next? Okay. You have to have a, by, by being curious, curious about the world, being curious about other people and yourself, uh, you're actually able to say, well, let me see what's coming, you know, uh, over the next four or five or 10 or 15 years. And I just, I just read a, a, a great book that was the skeptic's guide to the future. There's actually a podcast called the skeptic's guide to the universe. Three Brothers, Novella is, is their last name. Fantastic. I've been following them for, for years. Uh, they're part of the skeptical movement. Uh, and so one of the things that they, they did was they wrote a book. And I, I highly recommend it to anybody who wants to look over the horizon uh, in, in biology and in, in technology and in, in, in uh, space travel and in, in li literally everything. There's chapter after chapter after chapter uh, medicine uh, in this, this book that they try to take a skeptical view, but look over the horizon. And so, you know, where does technology go? You know, and there's dark sides, uh, and, and we're, we're exploring some of that right now with AI and all of the uh, all of the things that 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 might lead to. 
But at the same time, I'm a believer that technology is going to help us immensely uh, you know, evolve as, as human beings as long as we don't pervert the, the technology, uh, which is always the kind of the balancing act that you have is, you know, not, not get to a point where, the, you know, the technology is taken on by the worst kind of humans and put into practice so that it actually hurts us rather than helps us. You know, I'm, I'm probably the kind of the first in line when they say, well, you're ready to have this thing kind of I- I- embedded, uh, you know, in your head so that you can have kind of access to the, to the, to the world of knowledge uh, by just thinking about it. Bob Dan is probably the first in line to, uh, uh, to, to get that. So my, my, you know, my iPhone, you know, 15 Pro Max is probably still on the, on the journey uh, to being what potentially uh, is, uh, is going to be available to us. Bob, thank you for all of this, for being just so vulnerable and honest about everything. Um, and if anyone's seen, if you're enjoying uh, what he's saying in his voice, you got to check out his book. It's, it's plenty more of this. <laughs> <laughs> but like always, I want to wrap up with a couple pieces of advice and a spotlight. So let's start with this, Bob. Let's start with what is the best advice that you have ever taken? Yeah, okay, good. And I talk about this in the book as well. But, it, but um, my, my dad and I uh, actually... Uh, we're, we're totally different people. Uh, my, my dad actually was a, uh, a mechanic on the Long Island Railroad. He, uh, he didn't graduate high school. He was a arch conservative, uh, John Bircher kind of guy. You know, he worked with his hands. Okay. He was not an intellectual. Uh, he was, uh, a, a guy that, uh, obviously worked with his hands at work. He worked with his hands around the house, uh, worked with his hands on the car. Uh, and, and uh, Bobby was a klutz. And so uh, I couldn't do anything. Uh, he was a woodworker, brought me down to his shop. But it's a good thing I didn't cut off fingers or arms or legs or whatever uh, on the, uh, on the band saw. saw. Uh, but, um, you know, one of the pieces of advice that he gave me was, uh, you know, hey, Bobby, you better study hard, be smart, uh, uh, because you'll never be able to do anything for yourself. You're, you're going to have to get people to do things for you. So uh, be smart, uh, you know, grow up, get a, get a job, because uh, you're going to have to pay people to do things. It was the best advice I ever got. Uh, I took it 100%, and I'm still a klutz. Uh, I can, you know, ba- barely, you know, uh, screw in a light bulb. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I can, I can uh, you know, always go back. And, and whenever I can do something, I go, thanks, Dad. Look, I actually did it. <laughs> yeah, I, I was similar. I was always kind of the book guy. Dad was great with his hands too. Like when he was, you know, t- 10 to 11, he was taking apart on a whole bike and putting it back together. And I just, I never had that, that interest or that gene. I, I still get such a thrill when I like fix a leaky faucet. I get like, ah, oh, I, I have loved it. <laughs> me too. Me too. But I, I do, I, every single time I do thank him. And I say, D- look, dad, you know, I'm doing it. Yeah. Oh, man. All right. I usually ask, uh, what's the worst advice you've ever given? But you had something really that you wanted to share here. And we switched it around a little bit to what's the uh, what's the worst, worst advice you've ever been given? So I yeah. set that up for you. Well, thanks. And, and I, I did see the, the, you know, the question and I did reflect on it quite a bit. And I said, well, I, I, I try not to give bad advice. And I, <laughs> no, yeah, no, I, I probably give plenty of advice, but nobody ever told me or I don't I never really looked at it and said, well, that was horrible advice. I want to go back and, and take that back. But they, they, I get plenty of advice from from uh, from others. I, I think the worst advice I, I ever get is uh, when I engage uh, a, uh, a, you know, a financial services company for a financial mm-hmm. advisor for investing. Okay, and this goes back now probably the the better part of fifty years, forty years, oh, for sure. Wow. You know, every time I do that, you know, there's always hidden agendas. There's always uh, ulterior, ulterior motives to. Uh, uh, to recommending uh, a, a stock or a commodity or, or a, you know, uh, a mutual fund, whatever it might be to invest in, you know, then it's like, well, no, you should have, you know, I, it's only my advice. You should have done your, your own research. And so my conclusion, and I, I just tried to do it again, and it, and it ended horribly because I said, I don't want to, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I want somebody to kind of manage, uh, you know, uh, you know, any of my assets that are getting invested. Uh, so I don't have to do that. And, you know, over a period of, of, you know, 
a year or so, the thing just just tanked. And it was standard, standard kind of, you know, conservative investing. So my, my you know, it, 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 the worst advice I've gotten is when people have told me, uh, oh, g- get a financial advisor because they'll, <laughs> they'll help you. Um, you know, so my feeling is, no, with my curiosity gene, I'm going to turn that curiosity gene way up, uh, do my own research. Uh, doing my own tracking and trending and, and investment uh, uh, thinking. Uh, and uh, and actually, that always, whenever I back into that, it always works out great. Uh, I say, <laughs> I'm getting tired of doing this. I'm going to get somebody else to do it. Works out horribly. So I cycle back and forth and back and forth through that. I get this. Well, well how about this? Uh, and no one will pay you for it, but maybe people can call you for financial advice. <laughs> Absolutely not. That will be the worst <laughs> advice that I ever give anybody. Yeah, because uh, if you give it, it would take, right? Yeah, it exactly. only works on you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bob, it's been so great to catch up today. Thank you so much for your time. And now I want to put a spotlight on you. Where can people learn more about you? We, we know you're on the Facebook and the LinkedIn. Is that Robert Dana or Bob Dana? You, you find me under either one of those, uh, and if you just put, you know, Las Vegas, uh, you know, uh, you'll probably find the right Bob Danner. There's actually not that many Bob Danners out there. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a unique name. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's a unique name, but it kind of is. So if you do that, or, or uh, on LinkedIn, if you put Bob Danner and then Deloitte, because uh, that was my last uh, uh, organization that I worked for, or Facebook again and, and put Bob Danner and, and Las Vegas you'll find me. Uh, you'll also find me on, uh, I've got a website, www.mycuriouslife.net. Uh, and so if you go to mycuriouslife.net, you'll actually see the LinkedIn link on there. Uh, you'll Perfect. see other links to uh, Amazon where the book is, and obviously Ibis uh, where the book is. Uh, and so you can find all of that. Plus there's a, it's a kind of a nice, uh, what about Bob? Uh, go, go click on that because you'll see a bunch of questions about and you'll find out more. What about Bob? Probably more than you probably want to ever know. Uh, and uh, read the book. I'd really appreciate it. And uh, so that's how you find me. Bob, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your curiosity. And uh, I, to what you said earlier in the in the uh, recording, I again, I'm I feel very lucky to have crossed paths with you. And uh, I'm so proud of the the book we put out. And uh, everybody, go check it out. Thank you, Jason. It was a pleasure. Uh, this was so much fun today. Thank you so much. The Page and Stage podcast is built with Alitu, the all-in-one podcasting app created by the amazing team over at thepodcasthost.com. You can learn more about all my guests and access their websites and projects in the episode summaries. If you enjoyed and found value in this podcast, please tell at least one other person. Word of mouth has always been and will always be the best marketing tool in the world. Thank you for listening. And until next time, I'm Jason Cannon. I cannot wait to hear your story.